we're in the midst of a huge transformation where peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm the Partnerships and Community Manager here at All Voices. Today, I'm very excited to welcome our next guest onto the show. His name is L. David Kingsley, Chief People Officer at Alterx. Thank you so much for being here. If you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, hi, Christina. I'm David Kingsley. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, and even more important than the job title I do every day is what I think is the most important job title, which is uh, husband to my wife, Erin, and father to Jack and Kate. Um, that's the most important job in my life and in my world, and it's the one that I want to be remembered for the most. Um, and when I was little, uh, what I wanted to be when I grew up, I think I went through um, sort of a normal course of things, but at some, for some reason, by the time I was about eight years old, I decided I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Oh, wow. Um, now, how I decided on that is beyond me. Um, that aspiration ran directly into a brick wall when I encountered the, the higher orders of math. Um, in high school, and my uh, my B, A B Calc teacher told me this will be the last calculus class you take, uh, mm -hmm. and that was in high school, my junior year. <laughs> he said, "You work hard, but you just don't get it." <laughs> and and I said to him, "Okay." And I took him at his word, and I, I that was the end of my math career. So uh, my aspiration of neurosurgery went out the window, and uh, I ended up uh, moving into consulting when I graduated from college. Awesome. And when you fast forward from consulting to now as chief people officer, I always think it's interesting to ask the big, the big W, the why question. How do you think your personal journey has really led you up until this point, specifically at Alteryx as well? Yeah, I think, Christina, if you told me, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago that I would be the chief people officer um, in a public company and, and haven't done this a couple of times now, um, I probably would have told you, uh, no, you got the wrong person. <laughs> um, and, and the reason was uh, earlier in my career, obviously a, a less educated opinion, but maybe still in help to inform a bit of my worldview, I didn't have that positive a perception of the HR function. Um, and admittedly, this is 15, 20 years ago, but the HR function that I was encountering um, as a new professional and as a new manager early in my career was one that was really focused on um, policy and process and uh, telling me what I couldn't do and feeling like I was constrained, you know, by the human resources function around what I could and could not do. Uh, and I was trying to build a book of business and consulting and, and grow an organization. And frankly, um, at one point, I was sharing some of that feedback with my career counselor. And he looked me in the eye and he said, well, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and it was one of those moments where it kind of caught you dead in your tracks. And um, you know, it wasn't for a number of years later that I got a call from, from Salesforce, actually, um, from what Salesforce calls employee success. Uh, that's their HR function. And, um, and that was really where the journey began. Um, I got the call and I said, well, what are you calling me for? And they said, well, we're trying to think about doing HR differently. One of the reasons we're, we're saying that is we call it something different, uh, employee success. And I said, you have my attention. And uh, from there, um, one thing led to another, and I joined Salesforce uh, some years back, leading the HR business partner function for the go-to-market organization. Um, and that was really where sort of my career as an in-house um, HR person really sort of took off. I think that's really interesting. I think a lot of people, especially as you started out kind of your answer in terms of the perception you had of HR, and now people are talking about people and employee success is very similar, um, especially 15 or 20 years ago too. And it's constantly evolving and changing um, as well. And I'm sure you have many different projects that you're working on right now. And I have a, you know, a list of specific questions that I have for you around employee resource groups and your strategy, but want to open up the conversation by asking um, what's the next problem or situation you're currently trying to solve? What's taking up the most brain space? Well, well, um, I have a little brain. It's a big world. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, <laughs> opportunity in there. Um, <laughs> what's keeping me up the most at night right now, I think is it's a more um, sort of philosophical question or thing that I think a lot of us are wrestling with. And the way that we're framing it here at Alteryx within the people and culture team is talking with our, our leaders and our, our managers and ourselves about how do we embrace the now normal versus the new normal? 
So mm -hmm. we hear a lot of discussion about, oh, the new normal is this, the new normal is that. And I think that if anybody has a crystal ball and can tell me you know, what COVID-19 looks like at the end, please let me know. Uh, all I know is what we have today and where we are right now. And I think part of just being present for ourselves, for our companies, for our customers, for our communities, for our families, for our loved ones is all about embracing where you sit and stand right now as an individual, as a team, as a company, as a culture. And that now normal is the only thing that we know to be true because we're walking it today. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we got into COVID, if you remember, you know, uh, rewinding now, gosh, almost a year and a half, two years ago, yeah. we all were like, okay, we'll be home for like a week, you know? And people are like, oh, no problem. And then a week became a month and a month became a half year and a half year became a year. And, sure. and there have been multiple celebrations of milestones and, and highs and lows and things that we've all gone through in what is really the now normal. And every day it's something different. We've not final, finalized this journey. We don't know where it's going to end or what it's going to be. And frankly, this may be a lot of what it feels like for a long time going forward that it is going to be a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month journey that we're on as people, as leaders, as HR professionals, um, that we've got to be there in that mindset for our people. If all we're doing is grieving what was lost or anticipating or waiting for what is to come, we'll fail to be present for the now and for where our people and our families and our communities and our cultures need us um, to be. So long answer to a short question, but really embracing the now normal versus the new normal. And no one really knows what the new normal is going to be. Uh, at least I don't. No one's told me. Um, I do know what we're facing now. And I think it's important to be present in that and serve in that space. I think the now normal is a great phrase to use instead of like the new normal and just again anticipating what's going to happen in the future thinking about grieving as you said what's happening in the past and part of that too in terms of thinking about having a conversation with your team members like understanding where they are presently and their in their full lives inside and outside of work as well as they're just like you know it's a full cycle here um how have you used kind of data and employee feedback uh, from the team to implement any kind of changes over over the last year, two years? Yeah, I think one of the things that when I got into the HR discipline, I felt like as the chief people officer in these companies, everyone's looking to me or to my team for the answers. You know, what are we going to do next? What should we do next? What's going to be the next thing you're going to launch? And I rewound a bit of my own journey. And I remember thinking, as I just shared with you earlier in this call, you know, when I was facing um, a more traditional HR mindset in my career, it was frustrating to me. Um, I felt like I was being unserved or underserved and it was no fault of the, the people themselves. It was more just how the industry was thinking about itself and how it was structuring in order to serve the companies that it was a part of. And so when I came into these roles, I, I started scratching my head and said, well, what if we run a little bit of a different playbook here? And certainly here at Altrix, we've done that. Um, in the last you know, year and a half, um, I've been here, yeah, about a year and a half, I guess now, um, year and change, um, we've been actively engaging with our employee resource groups, with our ERGs um, here at Altrix to give us feedback and input and guidance, frankly, um, on the programs that we're running, you know, how things are going for the company. And um, one of the things I love is our, our CEO, Mark, he holds a monthly meeting uh, with all of the ERG leaders. Um, and it's an open forum. Um, the, the woman who leads our DEI and B team, Sharita, she sort of corrals the agenda and has a couple of topics, but Mark is on the call actively listening, taking on feedback and ideas from the ERG leaders who are accessing all different dimensions of the workforce, all different types of lived experiences of our employees. I'm bringing those right to the CEO. Um, it's fantastic. It's almost like having a second board of directors. Um, we have, of course, our corporate board as a publicly traded company um, that we rely heavily on and who are fantastic. And at the same time, having an internal board of directors of employees to make sure those voices are heard as well is equally critical um, for Mark and certainly for me. Um, in the last year, I think there are three things I would comment on um, that the ERGs have really raised to us. Um, and one of them has been um, our family forming benefits. Um, previously called fertility benefits, but family forming is a bit more of an inclusive term and it involves everything from um, gestational carrier, which used to be surrogacy, um, or, um, or uh, fertility treatments, whether it's IVF or IUI, um, but also adoptive uh, parents and adoptive families and embracing families in whatever type and form they come. Um, and so our ERGs came to us and said, we really would like more focus on that. Um, we hadn't yet had a family forming benefit in the company. 
And so we took that feedback on board and ended up partnering with a vendor called Carrot and launched that earlier this year. And um, I'm not at liberty, obviously, to disclose the details uh, about how used that is, but I can say um, across every part of our workforce, we have families who are using those services and that benefit we've launched. Um, and I'm going to be so excited to talk about the expansion of our Altrix family um, as families welcome new ones into their world and their lives, whether it's um, biologically or through adoptive or um, through a gestational carrier, um, they're expanding their families. Um, so that was one of the things that the ERGs brought us and said, hey, we don't have this here yet. We'd really love to prioritize that or we'd love to have you all prioritize that. So that went right to the top of our list. And Angie, who leads our, our benefits team, took that on board and, and great partnership, as I mentioned, with Carrot to get that launched and, and rolling. So that was one. Um, the second one was one that actually just came up about um, a month ago or so. We were on a call and our ERG leaders, one in particular, mentioned that he was trying to get a certification, mm -hmm. professional certification. And our policy was aligned only for um, undergraduate or graduate education. And up to the you know, U.S. federal limit of, I think it's $5,200 or something U.S. like that. And he said, however, it, it doesn't allow for certifications. And he said, I'd really like to get this cert for my professional world. I think it'd be really helpful to Altrix, but the policy is I can't do that. And so we're on the call and Christina, I was literally in the policy document as we're on the call, redlining the document myself um, and sent it off to the benefits team and to our employment legal team over to Allison and said, um, you know, what do we think? Can we do this? Can we change this? Let's open the aperture um, to be a bit more inclusive about how people learn and how they think about professional development today um, in the professional world. So, so we made that change almost on the fly and we're going to go forward with that you know, very shortly here um, inside the company to expand that aperture. So that was another one that meant something professionally to people. So there was something that meant something personally and family forming, something that meant something professionally um, in terms of education reimbursement. And then the last one I'll comment on is just something that uh, if there's one thing that I'm the most proud of that we've done here um, is launching some mental health holidays and mental health benefit days here at the company. Um, again, this was an idea that, that our, our CEO, Mark, had and, and said, what are we going to do about this? You know, our people are under strain and stress, and how are we going to make this work? And so what we did was we established a couple of company-wide holidays, one in the spring and one just in the fall, on Mental Health Awareness Day and for Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, that were company-wide, and then also added a couple of floating mental health days for folks to take. Um, the feedback that we've heard, which is great now that I've got, we've launched them, we've had four so far. Um, the feedback I've gotten is the company-wide days are the most powerful to people because it means they can be totally offline. Um, they don't have to worry about missing a meeting or missing an email. They can just take the day off. Um, and we've positioned them adjacent to a weekend so people can do a long weekend and truly unplug. The number of folks, Christina, who've sent us photos, um, posts on social media, on our Instagram feed, on LinkedIn, you know, Facebook, et cetera, saying, here's what I'm doing today. I'm taking a hike with a family member, or I'm reconnecting with someone in my family who doesn't have a lot of access to interactions, or I'm just taking time for myself to learn or breathe or live in a different way than I have been. Yeah. Um, it's fantastic. It's great to see. And all of those ideas you know, have come from and been supported by our employee resource groups. Um, who've helped curate our thinking back to the idea of, you know, why does HR exist? Well, we call ourselves, again, the people and culture team here at Altrix, and we're here for our people, and we're here to honor and nurture and build and, and scale the culture that was established by our co-founders 25 years ago. I mean, those are great, really specific examples, too, in terms of family forming professional development and mental health and wellness. I think that's really important. The greatest gift you can give someone is time. Mm -hmm. uh, and wide holidays when you are not worried that someone's going to ping you or slack you or, you know, email you is really important, taking time to reset. Um, and I think it's interesting that you're getting a lot of feedback from employee resource groups, and these decisions affect a lot of different folks at the company on a wide scale. I want to ask from your perspective as chief people officer, what are qualitative and quantitative ways you kind of measure that company culture or employee happiness? Yeah, one of the ones that I'm so proud of and, and really excited about, and this is a huge advantage of being part of an analytics company. So we talk <laughs> about Altrix drives analytic process ad automation and um, our tools and capabilities that we take to our customers, which are phenomenal in terms of the impact they drive, we use them internally also. Uh, mm -hmm. I like to call it drinking our own champagne. Yeah, um, yeah. I know Google calls it dog fooding. I don't, I don't, I've never eaten our dog's dog food. I don't yep. plan on it. It doesn't That's look okay. very good. 
I like champagne though. Um, and so we, we use our own technology here. Um, and one of the ones that we, we've used most prominently, and we just talked about this several months ago in our user conference called Inspire, is that we use Alteryx, an Alteryx workflow it's called in our, in our designer product to do um, pay analysis inside of our company. So to ensure that we are paying our people fairly and equitably um, one to the next based upon compensable factors um, in their role and their experience and their levels, um, we wanna make sure we're doing that properly. And we can use data science and analytics to make sure that we're doing that. That allows me then to look every Alteryx employee in the eye and say, not only are we paying you fairly, but we've done that using our own technology um, that, that many of our own people have built. They put their hands on it, so they trust it. They know it's good because they help develop it or they're marketing it or they're selling it or servicing it um, out in the marketplace. And so we, we take a lot of pride in that, that we use our own technology to, to do, add that benefit to our workforce. A lot of companies talk about equal pay, and I'm so glad that so many of my colleagues across the industry um, are embracing that, and it's become a real priority for us um, around um, around pay equity. That's just so critical uh, for what we do. And, and I'm proud to be able to do that on our own tech. Um, the other thing that we use, you know, our own technology for um, is looking at our diverse and inclusive hiring practices. Yeah. Um, earlier this year, um, our workforce came to us and said, hey, we want to hear more about the commitments that we as a company are making. And not, not you as the leaders, we as a company. I love the way that the workforce framed that because it was, a very, um, it was a very inclusive approach to how we think about our culture, that the company isn't the leadership team or the board or the executive staff, what have you, it's all of us. We all own the culture and we own the company together um, in terms of driving you know, forward. And so they said, what are we doing collectively? And so earlier this year, we decided that we were going to ensure that all roles in the company that we were hiring for were posted for five days mm -hmm. publicly. We interviewed a minimum of three candidates for each role. And every finalist candidate had to be interviewed by the, the leader's leader, the boss's boss. Mm -hmm. So what that did was it insulated us from any of what traditionally in some companies, some industries um, has been referred to colloquially as shoulder tapping. It's just, well, I need somebody to run X. Let me go get someone from my network. And most, most likely, Christina, if we map your network and we map my network, the majority of our personal networks probably would look a lot like you and I look in our lived experiences and our own backgrounds. Um, and that there's richness there, there's goodness there because that's part of who we are and has made us you know, the, the people we are today. And at the same time, a more open aperture to how we hire and onboard individuals in our companies is critical. We know that diverse teams make better decisions than more homogenous teams. It's just the facts, just, just science. Um, I like to drop a little science in there every now and again, right? Because um, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I wasn't allowed to be because I couldn't do the math. So I still try and bring it in. Yeah. Um, but, but we know that the research tells us that, right? More diverse teams make better decisions. And so, um, so we're very committed to that. And we have applied that that approach, uh, I won't say it's a policy, but it's a policy. Um, it's our approach that we use and it's repeatable. And we know that it speaks to who we are. It speaks to our core value of equality right behind me. Um, and it's meaningful to how we want to see our company continue to scale and grow. Mm -hmm. Of course, we do the analytics on all that in Alteryx. Um, and so our applicant tracking system um, then feeds workflows in Alteryx where we do that analysis to make sure that we're, we're doing what we say we're going to do. Um, and I'm happy to report that, that there's been an overwhelming support and embracing uh, by the leaders um, for, that, for that approach. Um, the other one that I'll just comment on, and maybe then we can move on, I don't want to stay too long on this one, is um, the, how we give back. Um, we're, we're currently in the process of partnering with a company called Benevity to launch um, a platform inside of our organization that will allow us to not only track the hours, volunteer hours that we give back to the community and every Alteryx employee um, you know, has 20 plus hours a year they can use to give back to their communities, um, but also how we offer up volunteer activities. One of the things that our leaders have done is committed to when we do an, um, a meeting, an offsite meeting, a quarterly business review, what have you, we're going to pair that with um, a period of service, whether it's uh, volunteering in the office, you know, writing, um, you know, cards or decorating bags for shut-ins or for, you know, sick people in hospitals or actively going out and volunteering in the community, partnering with one of these organizations to make sure that not only when we're focused on the business topics and growing and scaling all tricks, but we're also focused on giving back in our communities that we live and where we work and, and grow our families. So we're very committed to that. Um, and of course, we'll have great Alteryx analytics um, looking at all of that. 
uh, of how we do that. So those are a few of the ones. Um, and then we, we flow those through a lot of different organizations uh, inside the company um, that, we, uh, that we embrace those through. Well, it sounds very strategic and intentional, very holistic, which is important too. working with organizations, thinking about potential employees in the interview process and team members um, and your current team members as well. I want to go back to just the makeup of your employee resource groups and understand mm -hmm. what the current landscape is, how old are these programs and what ERGs are available today at Aldrix. Yeah, I would say that um, they're, they're at varying stages of their, of their journey. Um, some are a little further along. Some are still sort of forming and gathering and, and getting their agendas together. There are seven of them we have right now. Um, and uh, so they range from some of the ones that I think you would expect to see in most companies that we've seen. Um, our Alter Q group, which is our LGBTQ plus um, ERG, our BIPOC um, organization for, for uh, colleagues of color. Um, our Veterans in Service, I'm actually the executive sponsor of our Veterans in Service ERG. Um, I'm a Navy vet myself. Um, Women and Allies, um, fantastic group there. I'm actually uh, drinking from a Women and Allies mug. They offered an <laughs> Alter Talk session, um, sent me this great mug. It's got a big handle. I can get like two cups of coffee in it. It's fantastic. Um, so Women and Allies. But then we have a couple other ones that um, you know are, are newer, I think, on the landscape in companies. Um, that are fantastic that we have them. One is called Alter.eco, Alter Eco, which is our, our green group, um, supporting our environmental, social, and governance goals as a company um, run by a, a colleague uh, named Jennifer, who was formerly in our accounting department and now um, actually is part of the people and culture team, but who is also the leader of our Alter Eco group. Um, so we have that one. And then we have um, an interfaith group that uh, brings people of faiths all together. The last session they had was, it was awesome. It was so powerful. They came together and they talked about prayer and how prayer is different in different uh, faith traditions and cultures and communities. And they talked about, here's how I pray. And it, I get goosebumps even saying it because it was so in, informative. Yeah. Um, and for someone who's you know, been, a, you know, a, I hope to be a, a, say a global professional my whole career, I learned some new things and I thought I knew it. I thought I knew most of that stuff. And I was like, nope, I sure didn't. I learned some new things. So it's a great group to have the, the um, interfaith group here. And then the last one I'll mention that's sort of a non-traditional, but I think so, so critical these days um, is a caregivers employee resource group, caregivers. And they uh, stood up to say, look, anybody who's giving care right now, whether it's for an aging parent or a child with special needs or someone in your community that you are part of the caregiving team for, um, we oftentimes forget that caregivers need as much care as the people for whom they are caring. Um, and so that group uh, was stood up, Melissa and her team said, let's, let's get this going here um, to be able to, uh, to build that out. So, so the seven ERGs that we have, um, will there be more? Probably. Um, you know, one that I think is, is forming right now that has already got a good head of steam on it um, is talking about our early in career, our EIC uh, ERG that's forming right now. And that's for folks who are newer in their journeys. Um, when I came out of college, there was no real support there for me as a new career professional. It was just kind of like, um, uh, here you go, go work. And I was like, wait a second, I got to do this for 40 hours a week, like every day for five days around the nap in the middle of the afternoon and meetings start at like eight o'clock. And I haven't had a class at eight o'clock in four years, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so our EIC group is forming right now um, to really be present for our early and career professionals. So, so seven pretty soon will be eight. Um, employee resource groups here. And I'm sure there'll be more as, as groups come together and say, hey, we've got something we'd like to, to speak on or find voice on to come together. Um, we'll certainly be willing, ready, and able to support them to do that. I think that's great. There's a lot going on, a lot of opportunities to raise your hand to be part of employee resource groups, be part of the leadership team, I'm sure. As a former ERG leader myself, I love to hear what other companies are doing as well. We had a series at All Voices 2 around highlighting personal journeys to becoming leaders. Um, mm -hmm. I know from my personal experience, I am very passionate about this. I raise my hand to do the work because I enjoy doing it. But one of the constant questions that come up is around compensation for ERG leaders and what does that look like? Um, because it could turn into a, a second job. So I want to ask um, at Alteryx, like how are ERG leaders compensated and celebrated for their work? Christina, you nailed it. You used the, absolutely the right word and the word is work. <laughs> um, anybody who's who's led an ERG or been part of one or is an exec sponsor, it's a it's a job. It's a little yep. mini job in and of itself. And depending upon what you're offering, what part of your year you're in, it can be a, a really meaningful size job. Um, almost feel like a second full time job, depending on on you know what you're doing in there. And so earlier this year, Mark and I decided that we were going to really acknowledge and embrace that. 
that these are these are work responsibilities these folks have raised their hands for. And so we offer a, a modest but meaningful stipend for all of our ERG leaders Great. Um, to acknowledge that they're taking on additional responsibility inside the organization, um, that they've expressed gratitude for that, of course, for the money itself, but even more importantly, for the acknowledgement to say, we see you. Thank you for doing this. We appreciate what you're what you're doing to grow our company, our culture, to reinforce our core values, and to to really speak about who we are as an organization. So, so that was the first step. The second one um, that I was proud to partner with our CFO on was to actually provide budgets for all these groups. And so each of the groups gets a, a, a meaningfully sized budget every year that they can use to put on programs. They can um, they can use for uh, events, speakers. Um, swag. Um, right now, our veterans group is designing a t-shirt, um, okay. which I'm heavily involved in. I can't wait to do this. This t-shirt is going to be great. Um, okay. Anytime you've seen a military t-shirt, military units put everything under the sun on their t-shirt. It's, it's <laughs> like you can barely even tell what's on it because everybody's got, oh, it's got to have this and that. And so we're going we're gonna to have a really, really interesting military <laughs> vets t-shirt coming out pretty soon here. Um, but that's what those budgets are for. It's what matters to, to the ERGs. Okay. Um, and in many cases, Christina, you probably remember this from when you were leading the ERG, you go to a speaker and you say, hey, will you come and present at, you know, uh, a National Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month or what have you. And those those folks, they get asked to, to speak for free all the time. Oh, for sure. And, yeah. and, they're, and they're most of the time they're from nonprofit or non-governmental organizations. And we just think, oh, they just do things for free. It's like, no, they have to go buy milk for their families just like we do. Um, and so what we've done is we've empowered the ERG leaders partnering with their executive sponsors to offer honoraria to those speakers. Um, if you're going to come and speak on a topic, we want to acknowledge you and thank you for your time, that your time isn't free. Um, and so the budgets can be used for those as well. And what we've seen is an up level in the programming that now that the leaders say, well, we've got money to fund this. Um, one of the things I, I just love that recently happened, Christina, is the ERG leaders came together and they said, we would like to make a collective show of support for Afghanistan. And they pooled their resources and we made a substantial donation um, to a charity working, especially working with women and children in Afghanistan, which uh, as that country goes through the transition that it's been through in the last couple of months, um, is really negatively and deeply impacting uh, women and children in particular, um, as that goes, that, that society goes through a period of instability and transition. Um, and so our ERGs came together. So we talk a lot about intersectionality and how are we there for each other and how do we show up and stand up for each other? And um, and they came together and said, we want to do this. And we got the finance team together and they said, yep, we can make that happen, pulled the money and off it went. And we're, we're supporting um, a very needy charity right now um, working in Afghanistan. So great to see that as well, right? So these seven or eight ERGs um, doing their own thing, but also coming together um, at times when it really matters to, to do things in a collective way. I love that. I love to hear that. I think that's really important and just being proactive about that is, is great too. Intersectionality is, is always important in terms of programming, education. Um, then I think the kind of financial compensation, both for the leaders, but also for resources for them to do all the work that they're doing is, is really important to highlight as well. You touched mm -hmm. on this a little bit too um, uh, earlier in our conversation of how ERGs really help drive your benefits program, as well as anything else that you wanted to kind of add there to share with folks who are listening? Yeah, I think the, the ERGs helping to drive those programs is just so critical. It's, you know, we in, in HR, people in culture, we, we, we believe we have a pretty good read on things. And I think we do. I think our team does a really phenomenal job. At the same time, we may prioritize things in a different way than the workforce would prefer. Um, and ultimately, they're the, they're the end customers, right? I think about the employee as customer. They're the customer of what we do every day. So, you know, what business do you know has been in business very long that says, oh, I don't listen to my customers. I don't need their input. I just kind of put products out in the market and they love it. No, we got to listen to the voice of the customer. And so we try and do that at every turn, um, both broadly um, using, you know, the normal third party engagement surveys and getting, getting feedback that most companies do a couple of times a year. But then also, you know, through our listening, whether it's through an ERG um, or through different groups that form inside the company um, to provide uh, to provide input. Um, one of the other things that, you know, I think that we've recently had feedback on, this was really from across the workforce, and we're going to be leveraging, you know, Alteryx to do that, of course, is issuing for our senior executives, they already have it, and then we're considering rolling that out to our senior leaders and then eventually to our frontline leaders, um, the Know Your Numbers dashboard. And, you know, you get a lot of questions around, well, what are you doing about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? And, some companies go so far as to say, well, we're going to hire X percent or Y percent of this by that. And they set out these very clear 
metrics that they're going to accomplish. And I, I applaud the energy behind that. Um, I think that sometimes setting those numbers can put an artificial lens on what we're really trying to accomplish. Um, and what we're trying to accomplish is create more fair, inclusive, diverse you know, companies and organizations and cultures. We're not just trying to hit a number and then go, okay, we hit our number, we're good now. That's not the case. There's no finish line to equality. And so we're always gonna be working at that. So the idea behind the Know Your Numbers dashboard is to give leaders a sense of where they are and then look over time of what type of progress are you making? What programs are you putting in place? How are you embracing the core value of equality that we've set out um, in order to do that? And then what support do you need from us to do that, right? If we have you know, a leader come to us and say, you know, hey, look, I know, um, you know we're posting these roles for five days. That's great. We've got three candidates, but I'm always seeing the same candidates. Like I'm not even seeing a diversity inside of those candidate groups. Um, that's good feedback. We need to hear that and we need to know that. Um, and that empowers the managers to look at that and say, look, I've looked at my candidate pipeline and my flow, and here are some things I'm seeing. I want to partner with you on continuing to drive forward, you know, the commitments we've made. So it really co-ops it into, I go from having a, a people and culture team from, of about 100 people to an entire company of, you know, call it, I don't know, 17, 1800, 2000 people pretty soon here, all working on behalf of the EIMB, which is the goal. Um, that is, that is, all of us are part of that. It's not my job or Mark's job or you know any of our, our people and culture leaders, it's all of us collectively together to work on that. And we need data to do that. So that's where the Know Your Numbers you know, comes from. And we're gonna empower leaders and the HR business partners to do that um, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I like the phrase that you mentioned, there's no finish line to, to doing this work. It's not like, okay, yay, we're done. We're gonna check no. out. We have to stop working on it. And it's not, you know, it's not David's responsibility, Mark's responsibility to create an equitable workplace. It's really everybody's responsibility to do that as well and have right. that uh, mindset too. You have it as one of your values. Um, I want to ask in terms of, you know, your experience and what you're seeing in Alteryx, what is a must have people leaders in general need to incorporate in their strategy to be successful in the future and knowing that none of us has a crystal ball. So working with what we have right now. Yeah, hmm. I, I think I'm going to give you two answers, um, and they're both they're both equally important. I think um, the first is a big word that I can never spell correctly, but I think I know how to say it. Um, it's neuroplasticity. Okay. Um, neuroplasticity. It's this concept of you know our brains, based upon our experiences, you know they they mold and form and change and adapt in both structure and function. And again, I'm no neurosurgeon, but I wanted to be one. Um, <laughs> And, and the research and the, the reading I've done on that is truly, as we go through these experiences, either positive or negative or neutral, our, our brains do functionally change over time. Um, and so I think that, that mindset or a growth mindset, I guess is another way to put that around making sure that we're open to that, that we need to take on board whatever comes at us that day, that week, that month, that season, that year, um, and be mindful and present to that of how, how's that affecting me as a person uh, me as a leader, us as a team, an organization, a culture, a company, um, a society. Um, so truly to have that. And, and really that starts, frankly, with the people people um, for, you know, people leaders to have uh, in their in their mindset. Um, the second one um, is fun. Um, I wish that I could add that as a performance criteria in our performance feedback. Like, does this person have fun? Yes. Um, and, and it's making you smile and it makes me smile just to say it, this idea of, you know, is someone embracing their work? Are they having fun doing that? And the reason I say that is in many of our companies, certainly here in Alteryx, we do really serious work. Um, you know, the work that we do for our customers, the, the data that runs across our systems um, for our customers is some of the most serious data in the world. Um, healthcare companies, governments, institutions that serve all of us, um, you know, medical organizations, hospitals, these are just critical, critical data flows. And that's important work. We've got to get that right. And we got to take that really seriously. At the same time, we don't have to take ourselves too seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you ever are on a call that I'm on with frequency, I'll have Spotify up on my phone and I'll have like walk-on music for the meeting. And people are like, that guy's a little, he's just not quite all the way right sometimes. And it's because I want to smile. I want to have a little bit of fun. We're doing serious work. We're tackling serious topics. Um, and there's no reason we can't have fun while we do it um, and not take ourselves too seriously um, while we're doing serious work. So sort of two, two answers to your question. One, neuroplasticity, and the other one is fun. We got to have that um, in our strategies. 
I love that. I definitely am in the in the same camp and the mindset of taking the work seriously. What we do is important, but not taking ourselves too seriously. And I think that relates to vulnerability, empathy, and kind of being humble in the work that we're doing too. Um, yeah. I want to ask you another question in terms of over the years, I've learned a lot working with chief people officers and having these conversations for people who aren't as familiar with, you know, the role and what you do day to day, all of the many things. What is something that would make your job easier? Hmm. I think that um, if I could have, and this is more of a mindset, so it's kind of a, if I could have and a mindset I try to embrace, if I could have a crystal ball to look at the end of the day every day um, and look back on that day and say, how did I do it spending my time on the right things that day? Did I spend my time on the most important, most impactful things that day? Um, or did I sub-optimize? And we can get so um, into the weeds on the work that we're doing that we sometimes fail to kind of pull up to the higher level and say, am I working on the right things at the right time? Am I spending my time in the right ways? Because as you said earlier, Christina, the most precious resource we all have is time. And the time that we're spent working, which is very, very important, is time that we're spending not with other things in our lives that make them rich and meaningful, whether it's people or places or plants or things or pets or whatever it is, we're spending time away from those things doing work. And I very much embrace the um, you know, work to live uh, versus live to work methodology, even though my work is very important and I love it and I have fun doing it. Um, it matters to me in context of my life. And so when I'm spending those you know, X hours a day of working, I wanna make sure I'm spending them on the right things. Um, and so I'm always asking myself in that moment, am I working on the right thing at the right time? And if I had perfect knowledge of the future, I'd be able to look back on the day and be like, yep, I hit 10 out of 10. I think most days I get maybe like seven or eight out of 10, I would give myself a score on. It's it's, it's okay. It's getting better. It's gotten better than it was maybe earlier in my career, Um, but never perfect. I'll never be satisfied with that. But just, you know, being mindful about that, how we're using our time, um, I think is so critical because it is the most precious and scarce resource. Wow. Nobody has said uh, a crystal ball at the end of the day to do a look back. I think that's a very smart uh, and retrospective answer. I would take that uh, if somebody to ask me that question in the future. There you go. <laughs> that definitely makes sense. Uh, is there anything that I either didn't ask that you want to share with folks who are listening or maybe you want to see key takeaways from our conversation this afternoon that you hope folks bring with them to their organization or just with them just in life in general? Yeah, I think it's I think it's two things, and I, I got this question the other day, um, actually on our, our our Women and Allies Alter Talks. They asked me for this this question, and I I'll offer two pieces of just kind of thought um, and take them for what they're worth. The first is, and this came from our, our CEO from Mark. You know, back when uh, the last pandemic in 1918, I don't think any of us were around then. Maybe someone listening is, and if so, hey, kudos to you. Uh, thank you for all your contributions to the world in the last you know hundred plus years. The 1918 pandemic didn't leave us a playbook, Mm -hmm. uh, Mark said to me. He said, so, you know, the idea of saying, well, what do we do next? We don't know. We're we're figuring it out as we go. We're building this as we're we're moving through it. Just as a point of reference, the Model T Ford came out in 1908. All right. So the Model T had been in production for 10 years. I would love to go back in time and ask Henry Ford, like, what did you do during the pandemic? How did you handle that? What did your factories look like? You know, did you send everybody home? Did you go on Zoom? Um, they didn't. They figured it out and they worked their way through it, just like we're doing right now. Um, so that's uh, that's the first one. Is just we don't have a playbook for this. Um, the second one is maybe just a little bit of uh, of grace, um, giving it to ourselves, uh, to our colleagues, to our our people, um, to our world, right? To our to our colleagues and friends and neighbors as well. Of we're all going through this together and. Um, we're all going through it in our own way. One of my colleagues, Betsy, she says, um, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. We're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. And I love that analogy because someday you may feel like you're on a giant tanker ship and you're like just weathering the storm just fine. And other days you might feel like you're in a rowboat and one of the rows fell out of your hand Mm -hmm. um, and you're just getting tossed around. And I think that as we can give everyone some grace knowing that not everyone's experiencing this in the same way every day. And I think that's good just generally, not even during the pandemic, just in life and in business in general, um, to give some grace and allow for that, um, to meet people where they are and to open that space for dialogue to understand how is someone's lived experience presenting where they are today. Um, And then even in their own day, right? When we come to work in the morning, there might've been something that happened to you this morning that I have no idea happened, but I'm coming at you, you know, 
just blazing and you're like, David, wow, I got like two hours of sleep last night. Or, you know, I just spent an hour on the phone with a friend who really needed me and I haven't talked to them in five years or something. Um, that's part of your journey. And I got to allow space for that to, uh, to um, kind of engage with you in a, a true and whole authentic way so that you can bring your whole self to work. Um, I think it's just so critical um, that we do that and we just start from grace while we have that growth mindset um, and, and keeping that open aperture to what, what we should be and what we need to be today in our work and for the people we're working with. Show yourself some grace, show others grace. I think that is a great uh, call to action to end on for, for folks. Uh, David, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company here this afternoon. My pleasure, Christina. Thank you for hosting this. Thank you for everything that you do for our community. Um, you're helping to build thought leadership and keeping all of us thinking and ideating in new ways. You've had some phenomenal speakers um, on this series, people that I've had the pleasure and the honor to work with and to have met as well. So thank you for bringing us all together in this virtual world um, to connect and collaborate and share ideas and share space. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I definitely appreciate that. And as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we, we believe that employee feedback is critical for the success of the company overall. Have a good rest of your afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Take care.